What's up, folks? Feeling old today. Dragon. Just dragging today. It's Monday. It's, uh, I, I jump on Monday morning early. If I, uh, you know, let me uh, let me get on and do some storytelling. I got I got two two things today. We'll keep it short. Hopefully, you guys will enjoy this. It'll be a, a nice little fun Monday morning episode for you. Um, some stuff about auctions and stuff over the weekend that really got me thinking, and and that's the stuff you guys like because I, I've gotten so many great messages. You know, if I'm thinking it, uh, you know, you guys are thinking it too, and you like it. You know, that I'm I'm coming out of here and saying it because you know you're sitting there wondering, hey, is, you know, is that what I'm thinking also? You know, am I the only person thinking it? Um, you know, stayed up a little late last night. I was going to watch the Billy Joel concert. They started it late. And then in the middle of piano, man, they like cut it off for local news, which is crazy. The world is insane today. You know, over the weekend we have Iran and Israel and we have, you know, World War Three headlines and, you know, 930 AM Eastern time, the market opens up and everything is up. Uh, I should, I guess, tell you everything you need to know. Um, the market isn't really concerned and not really believe in the World War III headlines. What I find funny in the hobby space is how many people take those kind of headlines and try to turn it into the hobby. Like, oh, we got to buy Bitcoin. Or, hey, I think this is good for the card prices. And, uh, I, that's the kind of stuff you won't hear from me. But it's just interesting to see how everybody kind of you know will spin a narrative for themselves. Um, I'm going to take an episode a different way here. Um, it's Jackie Robinson Day. It's April 15th. It's also tax day. I am sorry if any of you are like me and had to cut a large check to the uh, the United States government. It is what it is. We all do our part, right? Um, you know, and if you guys got a refund, great. Buy some cards, you know, or buy some type one photos if that's your thing, or you know, some autographs or memorabilia, whatever it is, you know, whatever it is that makes you smile, makes you happy, happier than holding the you know cash in your hand. Um, yeah, so Jackie Robinson Day, April 15th, everybody's gonna be wearing you know number 42. Everybody's gonna be you know celebrating the day, integration of baseball. Um, you know, part of what makes podcasts awesome are um, stories. You know, people are telling stories, and, and there's a record of them. And I heard a, a Jackie Robinson story. It has to be like 15 years old. It, it, it's it's a it's a Christmas story. This could have been good to do Christmas, but I decided my Christmas episode this year I would become a poet. I'd put on a Santa suit and make a hobby poem, which, by the way, did not get anywhere near the love it should have. That took me a while. That took me a while to write. Go back, hit pause, go pull the Christmas episode up, and watch that again. I mean, a hobby Christmas poem towards the night before Christmas and all in the hobby. I mean, come on now. Uh, that, I probably worked more on that episode than any other episode that I've done. I've done like, you know, we're, we're talking like, I don't know, 1,150, 1,200. There's like some crazy number of episodes here. And that was the one I worked hardest on. I, I, I was expecting more love. Anyway, it's a Christmas story. Not my story, Lowell Cone. Um, you can find this story all over the place, A Christmas Tale of Jackie Robinson. But anyway, I'm going to read this. I'm going to tell you a story. I, it's, it's story time. I've been told I have a good storytelling voice and presence. It's Jackie Robinson Day, so bear with me for a, a little two-minute thing here. In 1948, a young couple with their little son moved into half a duplex house in Flatbush section of Brooklyn on Tilden Avenue, to be exact. Their landlady was African-American, but everyone else on the street was white, mostly Jewish, and things being what they were in those days, the white neighbors, they kept their distance. Except for one family, the Satlows. They lived two houses away. Sarah was the mom, and Steve was the oldest son, and Senna was the youngest daughter, and Paula, just three at the time, was in the middle. Paula later went to Berkeley and went to Stanford, and where we met and became great friends, the storyteller. Not a few years before the story was being told, Paul used to talk about that family from so many years before. They were still friends with her mom. Jackie did this, she would say, or Rachel said this. And one day in the late 1960s, I said, you keep mentioning these people, Jackie and Rachel. Their names sound so familiar. Should I know them? You know how in novels it sometimes says she fixed him with a stare? Well, she fixed me with a stare like nobody's business. Have you ever heard of Jackie Robinson? What do you know about Jackie Robinson? I said, well, I grew up two houses away from him. That fixed me, but good. Eventually, the Robinsons and Satlows moved out of the old neighborhood, but Sarah and Rachel remained friends. Paula told me this Christmas story. 
On Christmas Eve, 1948, Jackie and Rachel and Jackie Jr. were decorating their Christmas tree. The Satlow kids sat in the Robinson living room, amazed as the tree came alive with all the bright lights and ornaments. Jackie studied the Satlow children. He came to the conclusion that the Satlows could not afford a Christmas tree of their own. So while Rachel and Jackie Jr. continued to decorate the tree, Jackie slipped out of the house and drove around Brooklyn until he found a Christmas tree lot that was still open. He bought a tree, divided his ornaments and lights in half, and delivered the new tree and ornaments to Sarah Satlow, who strangely stood at her door speechless. Jackie went home, puzzled by her reaction. He reached the logical conclusion he had not been a gentleman. He should have offered to put up the tree and decorate it for Sarah. He told this to Rachel, who readily agreed. Jackie and Rachel walked back to the Satlows and were surprised to see the entire family sitting on the floor, staring at the tree. They had not put up one single decoration. Jackie stared at Sarah. Sarah stared at Jackie. Sarah told Jackie the Satlows were Jewish and didn't celebrate Christmas. Talk about an awkward silence. Then Rachel started laughing and Sarah started laughing. We're putting that tree up, Sarah announced. If my mother and father come to visit, they'll have a fit. But this is one Christmas. The Jewish family is going to have a Christmas tree. And they did. They had the second Christmas tree on Tilden Avenue. The Robinsons had the first. Years later, Paula said she wanted to do a favor for Jackie and Rachel. Their youngest son, David, was driving out to Stanford. Could he stay in my place in Redwood for a week? Of course, I said yes. Point being here, the story continues. I thought it was a funny one because it hits home for me because I have a Christmas tree every year. and My kids are awed by it. Jackie, the story. I was going to bring up a card here. But I'll just post it on my Instagram. You'll get it. Thoughtless. This is... You know, 1948, Christmas 1948. Dude's got some stuff going on in his life, wouldn't you think? You know? Death threats and the like. Integrating baseball. December of 48 is when he signed his famous contract. You've seen the picture with, with Branch Rickey. Um, and I bring this story up because I have an autograph signed by Jackie in December of 1948. Pretty cool. Um I'll post it on my story again. It's a government postcard. It's a uh, you know, little kid writing to Jackie using a government postcard saying, hey, I'm a big Dodger fan and I like you the best. Can you sign my autograph? And of course he did. And, you know, it's postmarked right on the back there, December 1948. Right around probably when this, you know, a week before this story happened. <laughs> pretty nuts. That's a pretty cool thing. It's one of those things that kind of ties the hobby that we're in to real life, right? Here's a story, something that happened, you know, Jackie Robinson in 1948 decorating a Christmas tree. The week before that, he signed an autograph that I own for a kid who was a fan. Interesting to kind of put it in that type of perspective because I think you have to think about that with what you're buying, what you're collecting, what you're doing with your hobby, the stories that they tell, whether they're you know important enough, whether they are something you want to collect. And, and let's take a step back from that. Whether or something is important enough, it can be a very subjective question. I mean, your first baseball game that you ever went to, Rick Aguilera might have been the pitcher. So a ticket stub from that game signed by Rick Aguilera might be the most amazing collectible for you. It might not be something that holds tremendous value for the rest of the world. So there is a subjective nature to this. If you're somebody who's in this trying to buy items that are um, going to go up in value, then you have to be more objective about it. That Rick Aguilera ticket is probably not going to be something that holds a whole bunch of value to a lot of people. So objectively, it's not something that is probably something that is going to, um, you know, go up in value over time. Doesn't mean you shouldn't collect it. Doesn't mean it's worthless to have in your own collection. And that is kind of the divide here, right? Um, and it's one of those things I've been thinking about a lot. The hobby itself. We're in a very different spot than we were when I was a kid collecting and I wanted to own a card. And every time I bought a card hoping that it was something that was going to be worth more 
as a kid, I seemed to be steered the wrong way. You know, the intention was not pure. And it, it's funny to think about it. The uh, the line of, you know, cards aren't – we don't love the cards because they're valuable. The cards are valuable because we love them. You know, that fun little line. It's an important thing, right? You know, some of the most expensive cards that are out there, they have value because so many people want them. And so many people want them because of some – Nostalgia, some draw, some you know memory, some need to have it. Um, you know, sometimes it's even more than that. Sometimes it's something that's iconic. A lot of times, though, it just goes down down to it's something that more people want than there is supply for. And it gets me to my 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 fun little topic. And again, I, I told you I keep it short, right? I started off with a silly little Jackie Robinson story, and you know, I'm going into this now. It was a card that ended at auction this weekend that I was actually looking at. I was considering buying. And I had this, I don't want to call it a conundrum. I don't want to call it an epiphany, but my thought process will be interesting, right? I'll tell you the card. It was a Michael Jordan PMG. Probably surprises you, right? Because I've come on here and said PMGs are kind of pumped up. Michael Jordan's kind of pumped up. But it was being sold in an auction house that doesn't get as many views as it probably should. Mile high auction house. Um, you know, it doesn't get looked at. It's one of my favorite things to buy from auction houses that the, you know, the, the average folk is not buying from a card like that is never going to really fall through the cracks though. Um, but you don't really see, you know, too many people talking about mile high. Damn. If you don't see enough paid advertisements for PWCC, if you don't see enough paid advertisements for golden, um, and you know, there's people talking about their stuff, right. Um, you know, obviously those auctions are promoted. You don't see so much for mile high. Anyway, up until, you know, bidding ended, this card was in the ones. I was watching it all week. Um, it was a PSA 5, newly graded. Um, again, didn't go under the radar. Clip Media from Ravel, he did a little tweet about it, uh, about how this was like two kids, uh, two friends who bought two packs. Should we split it? But they didn't split it, and one guy got nothing, and one guy got this card, and now is selling it so many years later um, and making a small fortune. But I've looked at prior sales, I've looked at past sales, and you know, my hope was that I could potentially buy this card and it would fly under the radar. It's not the highest graded one by far, you know, it's in a PSA slab, which is good. Um, and I know from a fact there are harder grading on these cards. I mean, I had my Shaq PMG in a Beckett slab, and you know, I know that the grade would be significantly lower in a PSA slab, which is why I left it in the Beckett slab before I sold it. Um, you know, the edges chip. It's just the way it is on those cards. And this one was, you know, no different. But my hope was I would buy it and I would be able to sneak in uh, and and kind of, you know, purchase this thing for a, a great price. It got me thinking. At the end of the auction, I obviously, I didn't win it. Because I don't know if that's a card or that type of card is one I could ever buy work through this with me and let me know in the comments whether or not you guys understand what I'm saying, agree with what I'm saying, think I'm an idiot. If the card was barring that this thing fell through the cracks, right? And it had happened, but usually on lower end stuff, not, not a card like this, but barring through it falls through the cracks. Let's just say I was able to buy this card for high ones, right? Because that's what it was at before it went into extended bidding. And I think to myself, should I put the bid in now? We're talking about paying $180,000, $190,000 for a single card. Okay, so let's just get that out there. That's the value we're talking about of a card. And I said to myself, well, it, am I really getting this card at a bargain if I'm the only one who's willing to pay $180,000? Like if I'm going to be the final bid on this one, then – Am I really getting a bargain? Because I'm just beating out what everybody else is willing to pay. I'm the only one willing to pay this. And it didn't take long for me to say to myself, you know what? If, if, if I win this card in the high ones, it's most likely because that's what it's worth. 
and I'm the idiot who's overpaying for it. I'm the one who's jumping in and paying too much for a card in a lower grade. I'm the one that's providing some exit liquidity for somebody when a card like this might be being propped up or might only be worth what the market is willing to pay. It had me thinking for a minute about auctions in general, about cards in general. And if you win them, you're setting the new price. You're setting the new you know, standard for it. You know, if you believe in the card, you believe in the item, it shouldn't be a problem, right? Why is it only took a minute is because even while I was doing this mental gymnastics, the card got bid, bid, bid. And it got to a price where I said, this is absurd. And I'm, I would, I mean, I think it's sold for over $300,000 for a PSA 5. I would never pay that. But therein lies the rub. Should I have been bidding and hoping to get it at 190? Clearly, there were other people who were ready to bid. I wouldn't have won it anyway. So it's kind of a, you know, uh, mental gymnastics that I shouldn't be going through. I'm not willing to pay three and change for the card. But obviously, somebody is. Or are they? You know, is this someone who already owns a bunch and is defending the price of this? Sort of like the Michael Jordan card was for a while and might the Michael Jordan rookie card was for a while and might still be being protected. A lot of money in these cards. A lot of people who own, you know, not that many people who own a big chunk of them. It's an interesting thing that I was thinking about over the week. I was caught, I felt, between a rock and a hard place of the card is either going to be one of two things. It's either going to be too expensive or it's going to be too cheap. And what's the reason for both of them? And is there kind of a sweet spot in the middle there? It was an interesting thing that I... Uh, you know, I found myself in a fun little predicament of uh, if I could have gotten this card at what I considered a bargain, I think I would have been really sitting on my hands waiting for the next comparable sale to almost kind of, you know, let me know whether I was an idiot who overpaid for a card that the market is silly on or, you know, was my, my, uh, was my purchase a good purchase? Did it really fall through the cracks? And I got a bargain. And ultimately, I decided not to, you know, to get involved in the race because really what I realized at that point in time was it wasn't a card that I wanted for the right reasons. We go right back to that. Because if I'm so concerned about, am I buying this in a bargain? Can I get it because it's slipping through the cracks? What's the next price going to be? Blah, blah. I'm really not buying a card that I love. I'm not buying it for the right reason. I'm not buying it because it's a card I want to hold on to forever. I'm buying it at the time I was putting a bid in because I thought I would be able to get something for less than it should sell for. And there's nothing wrong with that. But there's a lot of that going on in the space now. And a lot of people are wrong and they wind up dumping and the same card comes up for sale over and over and over again. And I was part of this also. Um, and it's hard not to be when, you know, we saw the kind of the run up and the craziness of cards. The card, the card I always come back to is the LeBron Chrome Refractor in Beckett 10 that there's only 32 of. It's a card that should not be seen as often as it is seen. And yet here it is. I owned one. I bought it. I bought it for so much less, like 25% of the price that it was when it hit its peak. And I'm like, wow, look at the bargain I've gotten. Well, the 10 people after I bought it got bargains too. And so did the person I sold it to. And maybe it continues to go down. And maybe someone's going to keep getting bargains on it. I have no idea because that card just continues to come up for sale, for sale, for sale. And I realized that I did not buy that card because it was a card that I love. It was not a card that I needed to have. It's a card that when I made that purchase, I thought I was buying something that was a good investment. And I think the lesson that I learned and continue to learn as I go through these mental gymnastics is the cards that are good investments are the cards that you buy because you love them. Because that's the card you're going to be less likely to resell. And if it's a card you're less likely to resell, chances are it's a card someone else is going to be less likely to resell. They come up for sale less often, meaning those cards will continue to increase in value, not because of the value itself, but because 
subjectively, so many people want to own that card for whatever reason. The price continues to increase. So I think about that when I evaluate my collection, when I evaluate my spending habits and what I buy and what I sell and what cards I still own. So that's it. There we are. Lots of fun. Lots of fun stuff. I try to, you know, I try to talk about my own collection, my own hobby journey as much as I can because I know you guys are going through your own. I want to give you some insight into the lunacy that is in this head here. And, uh, you know, hope you enjoy. I hope you enjoy that silly little uh, Jackie Robinson Christmas story. I told it because I was going through my Jackie stuff today, and I own a bunch of Jackie stuff. I think he's one of the most influential people, one of the most influential, you know, names in sports in the last century. Um and I think, you know, the iconic nature of his story is something that will make his items collectible for a very long time. Also, I want my kids to own a Jackie Robinson auto, each one, because of what he stood for. Um, and I wanted you to hear that because one of the one of the pieces I own, he literally signed. Like, he touched and signed and mailed out to somebody like a week before that story happened. Pretty crazy. It's one of the cool things about collectibles, one of the cool things about, you know, I clearly never watched Jackie Robinson play because he retired from the sport well before I was born and then passed away too soon. Um, but I still have this item that gives me sort of a connection to that player. But then you, you find a story like this that happened right there at somebody else's story, somebody else's connection to the man. And here is, you know, I'm sure there's plenty of other, you know, items that he signed and, you know, right around that time. But it, to me, it's, it's one of the cool things about the space that we operate in and, you know, try to find your own item like that. And that'll be one that you don't want to sell. And in turn, it'll be one that most likely goes up in value because of that. And there's episode 132, Stealing Home. Talk to you guys soon.